Good afternoon, everyone. We are excited to introduce you all to today's guest speaker, Blaise Aguera Yarcas. He graduated from Princeton with a bachelor's degree in physics in 1988. Later on in his career, he founded Sea Dragon, a program which, in short, allows one to view extremely large and high resolution images without the high loading time. This software was then acquired by Microsoft Flight Lab. He was offered the position as the vice president and fellow at Google Research, where he leads an organization working on both basic research and new products in AI. There, he founded the Artist and Machine Intelligence Program, where he used machine intelligence and art. Along with his work, he is also an active TED speaker. He has given TED Talks on Sea Dragon, Photosynth, Big, Big Maps, and Machine Creativity. Fun fact, in 2007, he gave one of Bill Gates' favorite TED Talks, How Photosynth Can Connect the World's Images. In 2018 and 2019, he also taught the course Intelligent Machinery, Identity, and Ethics at the University of Washington, emphasizing the importance of computing and AI in combination with history and philosophy. As for his words, he was named for the MIT Technology Review as one of the top 35 innovators in the world under the age of 35. Thank you. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Blaze. Thank you so much. That's such a kind introduction um, and uh, really flattering. Uh, and I'm, I'm really sorry that I, uh, that I couldn't be there in Purdue uh, in person today. Um, my, um, uh, my father is, uh, is very ill in, uh, in Florida and uh, I'm, I'm likely going to be um, on a, on a, plane uh, late tonight um, to um, to go be with him so uh, it's uh, you know it's it's unfortunate I, I um, I've been giving uh, remote talks at, at SSP uh, for the last um, uh, couple of years um, I, I, I'm an SSP alum myself and and it was a very formative experience for me uh, and I was hoping uh, you know after you know with with COVID sort of settling down a little bit that uh, that I would that I would be able to do it in person this year but uh, it wasn't to be um, anyway, um, so um, I'm here today to talk about AI, and uh, it feels like a very, very interesting time to um, to be to be speaking about this topic. And I feel like we're in the midst of a pretty big sort of a Copernican revolution uh, with with respect to um, uh, to intelligence as a whole, and. Uh, and and our place in the you know in the known universe as the the uh, this you know so-called sole intelligent species. I don't believe that we are. There are lots of other animals, you know, even here on Earth that that, that are intelligent as well. Um, and now we start to have artificial systems that I believe are intelligent too in fairly profound ways. Um, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and start um, sharing my screen uh, so that I can show you a few slides that I made. And I'm hoping that after um, after going through these, we'll have plenty of time for uh, um, discussion as well. So um, can you all see the screen? Yes. Um, all right, so the second golden decade of AI. Now, um, some of you might know that the term artificial intelligence was invented in 1956 by this group of dudes, they, they were they were all dudes um, at uh, uh, at Dartmouth, and um, John McCarthy, one of the one of the uh, um, organizers of this of this workshop, said an attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, and solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. We think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. Now. Computer science is full of uh, missed deadlines and you know bugs that people think you know will take uh, you know a, a week to solve and end up taking a month. But this is like one of the most famous understatements uh, or or um, overly optimistic statements, I guess, of of, um, uh, of of computer science history. So obviously nothing happened in a few months, um, and in fact, the survivors uh, got together 50 years later in 2006, and all agreed that basically no progress had been made in solving AI as, as originally formulated in 1956 uh, in, in the previous half century. Uh, and in fact, uh, most of them believed that it probably wouldn't get solved uh, in the next 50 years. Uh, you know, the, the, not, you know, not only were we nowhere, we didn't even know which directions to go uh, to, make, to make progress at, at, these, at these profound problems. 
Now, the the timing was a little bit unfortunate. It's, it was a little bit of a you know darkest before the dawn sort of thing, I suppose, because um, as it turns out, deep learning was already taking off uh, in in 2006, although it was still not not um, sort of so mainstream. And in the few years that followed, uh, there were a series of, of of breakthroughs that really did solve um, all of the problems that that the Dartmouth Summer Workshop uh, posed in 1956. And I feel like now we're a little bit in the role of the dog that caught the car. Um, so, you know, like <laughs> seemingly we have solved all these problems, but but there's sort of this confusion about like, well, you know, now what? Or, or you know, how how is this even being thought about uh, by, by the public? I feel like if we had, you know, solved AI or gotten anywhere close to where we are today, um, in you know 1960 or 1970 or 1990 or even 2000, there would have been a lot of excitement, and we'd be having all sorts of all sorts of discussions about what it all means. And instead, um, it's it's being met with a very different sort of response now in 2022. Um, that response feels like it has three different sort of uh, branches uh, that 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 I can see. Um, one is um, the uh, AI will kill us all. Uh, you know, it's a Terminator uh, existential oh, yeah. risk uh, sort of uh, sort of talk uh, from the likes of Elon Musk and uh, the late Stephen Hawking and so on. Um, and this was uh, popularized uh, in 2014 by Nick Bostrom's book, uh, Superintelligence, which, which has all sorts of doomsday scenarios about AI in it. Um, then there is uh, the contingent of people like Blake Lemoyne, who some of you may have heard about, the uh, neo-Wiccan or neo-pagan uh, Googler who has come out um, on, on TV saying that, that, um, that Lambda is sentient uh, and is like a seven or eight-year-old kid, um, and, uh, and that, that he believes this because of his deeply held uh, religious convictions, uh, and therefore we need to be having a robot rights discussion. Uh, and then there is a, a sizable contingent, I would say the majority perhaps even, of AI researchers and, um, and people in AI ethics especially, who are basically saying AI is fake, um, that, that uh, you know, there's no such thing as artificial intelligence, it's neither artificial nor intelligent, uh, it's just a, um, a, a kind of a, um, cover for uh, corporate exploitation of click workers and the uh, reinforcement of heteropatriarchal uh, ableist narratives and uh, you know and so on uh, and that, and that you know, don't believe your lying eyes there's nothing here there's nothing here to see um, these all strike me as um, as kind of off target and uh, and and so I'd, I'd like to talk about you know fourth possibility that I'm not that I'm not really uh, seeing very much in the discourse which is that you know, there's something very real happening right now, and, and it is very exciting. Um, and it definitely has, uh, you know, there's there's cause for concern about AI, but it's it's not it's not really the, the Terminator thing as such. Um, and uh, and there's also cause for excitement. Um, and and let's let's sort of you know look at what we've got and and try and understand it and 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 what it means. So, uh, what I'm going to try and do in, in the talk is is first explain. Um, what what the revolution has looked like in the last couple of years? What has changed about uh, about machine learning, especially since 2019 or 2020? Um, and the role that modeling others plays in that, um, what it means to build AI inclusively uh, and, and how we might go about doing that. Um, and also what, what it means to build ethics into AI systems and how we might go about doing that. Um, the benefits and the dangers of democratizing access to, uh, uh, to such models uh, as well. And, uh, and why it's important to stop pretending that AI isn't real or can't understand um, why, that, why that, that might be an idea that is preventing us from actually looking at the things that really matter right now. So uh, I'll begin with, with sort of a, a brief history of the eras of machine learning. Um, which I've just named, you know, it's a silly convention, but I've just named them like 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Uh, 1.0 was the era of small models and small data and algorithms. Uh, and this era um, began with the birth of machine learning itself, uh, which um, back in the, in the old days was called cybernetics. Um, actually, the term artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy in order to, distinct, to, to try and distinguish it from, um, uh, from the cybernetic tradition, which uh, Norbert Wiener uh, had, had really uh, kicked off uh, and his collaborators. Um, and uh, um, 
anyway, well, I won't go into all the details of this of this uh, history, but um, the the bottom line is that from from the 1950s up until um, 2000 or 2010, uh, the great majority of the value in computing uh, was being realized by handwritten code uh, that was um, uh, you know that was doing specific tasks that had been programmed by by human programmers uh, and not you know sort of written not learned uh, uh, engineered not learned and um, machine learning was really a sideshow uh, there was very very little um, being done with machine learning beyond uh, beyond sort of trivial small models uh, you know doing doing small things here and there um, uh, you know people talk about algorithms as being anything that a computer does for me the term algorithm has a little bit more specific a meaning um, there's a book called algorithms uh, that you know begins with things like quick sort and uh, you know other sorts of, of of code that you can write for me an algorithm is a sequence of steps uh, that are you know written by a person and that and that um, uh, you know that you kind of carry out and that and, and that and that are not to very specific uh, computation uh, not something learned now, uh, the deep learning era, you know, really took off right after that 50th reunion uh, of, of, the, of the AI coiners. And, um, you know, for round numbers, let's call it 2010 to 2020. And this is an era when companies that uh, were in the business of running big data centers and aggregating a lot of data uh, were able to make really rapid progress on, on machine learning by using those resources. And... Um, and those those uh, deep learning models were generally for doing a specific job. So um, you know there, there was there, like a hot dog detector. Uh, you know that's a specific job. You know recognize whether there's a hot dog or not in a picture. Um, there was a parody of that a few years ago. And the way you train such a uh, such a deep learning model is you know by having uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pictures of hot dogs. Uh, and of things that are not hot dogs, and um, uh, and and basically just designing a neural net that takes pixels in, and emits a single bit that says hot dog or not hot dog, and uh, and and training that function to uh, to minimize its error, to minimize the loss, and this worked really well um, at all of the problems for which you can define um, a ground truth uh, and and a loss function, so. Um, you know that that also included things like um, speech recognition, because we can say, you know, what is the correct transcription of of a of, of a waveform, um, and um, and character recognition. You know, reading reading uh, text from an image, and face recognition, and all sorts of other things. Uh, you know, you can you can be very precise about you know what what is the correct answer, and um, and for the first time with with big data and and a lot of a lot of uh, training uh, using using uh, big computers, uh, one can. One can train functions that will do those things better than uh, than anybody could produce with handwritten code. So you know you can try to make an algorithm that will recognize a bicycle, say, by looking for wheels and saying it has to have two wheels and um, uh, you know and a seat and a chain and, and so on. But uh, but those algorithms do much much worse than a learned function that just learns from images of tens of thousands of bikes. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, know this. Uh, it's uh, you know it's kind of been the story of the last decade in, uh, in, in AI. But now we're in a different, a different, uh, a new chapter, and this may be a story that you uh, know less well because it's very recent. So, uh, what is happening now? What are these foundation models? So, um, foundation models are unsupervised, uh, and what that means is that they're not, uh, they're not models that are designed to evaluate a, you know, a specific function with, you know, a specific output like hot dog or no hot dog. They are models that are designed simply to model. The, the data that they are trained on, uh, self-supervised, they're sometimes called. Um, so, uh, you know, for the language models that have really been sort of the first generation of these things, uh, those data uh, uh, often consist of just um, tons of text from the web, uh, all of Wikipedia and most of Reddit and a bunch of other sites. And, um, and they're just about, about modeling those contents. Uh, the models can be very large. Um, so, you know, deep learning models are already pretty big. These, uh, these foundation models are generally even bigger. Uh, they're, they're pushing up to a trillion parameters uh, nowadays, um, which is uh, vast relative to the machine learning models of, uh, you know, of 10 or 20 years ago. Although I should point out that they're, they're not vast relative to the brain. 
uh, we have, um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit apples to oranges, but we have something like 80 billion neurons in our heads and orders of magnitude more synapses than that. So many more than a trillion parameters. Um, but anyway, the, the models are unsupervised. They're large, they're general, meaning that they're not trained to do any specific task. Uh, they're, uh, they're increasingly multimodal. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, many of you have seen things like Dolly Mini and, um, uh, and, and Imogen and, um, uh, and Midjourney and so on. Those, th so those are foundation models that include images. Uh, there are foundation models that are being trained with video as well nowadays. And, you know, I'm fully expecting that there will soon be foundation models that are trained with all of these modalities. And also one throws in seismic data from, uh, you know, from earthquake monitoring stations and x-rays and genomic data and uh, everything else. So, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow's foundation models will be thoroughly multimodal, meaning that they will have learned the statistics of, um, of, of every kind of data modality, everything that can be represented as data. Um, the fact that, that language is a part of this story, that, that uh, the text from, uh, from, from the internet is part of what they've been trained on, I think is important because making those models language capable means that whatever else they understand how to do, whether that's, you know, x-rays or, um, uh, or MRIs or earthquake data or whatever, you can also talk to them. Uh, and language is pretty important because uh, language is, is the way we communicate abstract ideas back and forth. It's the way we ask for what we want. Um, you know, using our words uh, turns out to be very, very important, not just with each other, but uh, but also in our future with uh, machine learning in, in ways that I will explain. Um, and uh, they are also temporally persistent and interactive. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, a, a hot dog or no hot dog uh, model really is just a function that takes in an X, which is an image and spits out a Y, which is one bit. And it's, you know, there's the one shot and that's it. Whereas anything that uses uh, language um, is inherently a little bit more like a, uh, like a chatbot. Uh, there's, there's a back and forth. Um, and, uh, you know, at the moment, most of these chatbot type things are turn-based meaning that you know that they're they're like a chess game you know there's there's a, a, a reply and then you post something and, and so on but um you know but but increasingly they're going to be more real time more continuous in time and and, um, and that's very different from just a a function that that you know that you evaluate and then it's kind of groundhog day the next time you evaluate the function now the um the actual model that uh that is in wide use right now for a lot of these uh foundation models is some variation on the transformer which I've put up here on the screen. Um, it's a little beyond our, uh, I mean, I, I could certainly explain how all of these boxes work. There's nothing here that's, you know, that's, that's uh, super complicated, but um, it would take us a little bit too long uh, to, to go through uh, the boxes. Um, suffice to say that, you know, the first time I saw one of these diagrams uh, for a neural net, um, I, you know, I kind of assumed that each of the boxes, you know, kind of like, um, like an architecture diagram in computer science is hiding a big complex machine, you know, that there's a lot behind uh, every one of these. There is not a lot behind every one of these. Uh, you know, every one of these boxes can be expressed uh, with, you know, just a few lines of code. The, the entire code basically for something like a transformer model, you can write in a few screenfuls of Python. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the code or the algorithm, if you want to think about it that way, is remarkably simple. Uh, and it doesn't have uh, you know, it doesn't have any of the answers in it. The you know, you can't read the code and understand anything about, uh, you know, why it's able to do all of the things that it's able to do. None of the none of the content of the neural net is in the algorithm or in the code. It's all in the weights. Uh, it's all in those in those um, you know billions or trillions of parameters. Um, just like, uh, you know, the algorithm for our brain might might just be like for each neuron, uh, take the inputs. Uh, you know, do some kind of a sum, apply a nonlinear transformation and produce an output. Like that's the algorithm. Uh, but, but of course, what our brains do is a function of what all of those connections are uh, and, and, and how they all have been learned. Um, so so what, is, what is this, um, what does training look like? Uh, this um, uh, pre-training step uh, in which, you know, it learns from all of the text on Wikipedia or on Reddit or something is basically about prediction. And, um, and, and so the way it works is that, um, you know, I'm just illustrating with a random, a completely random Wikipedia article. Um, I've, I've taken a, a random Wikipedia article. This one is on the COVID-19 pandemic in Peru. It just happened to be on the front page of, of wikipedia.org on, on, the, on the day that I looked this up. Um, and I've blacked out a number of words. 
So um, pieces of these uh, Wikipedia articles, single words, phrases, sentences are blacked out. And the training is basically uh, all about having the model do an increasingly good job of predicting what goes in the blacked out, bit, in the, in the blacked out bits. Um, so why does that do anything interesting? Well, if, if we try it, you'll start to get a sense of why that is interesting, why that, why that forces certain things to happen. So uh, for instance, um, you know, according to the Institute of Economics and Business Development of the Lima Chamber of Commerce, the country's middle class something by almost half from 43.6% in 2019 to 24% in 2020 due to the crisis. So, you know, if I were to ask you, like, is, is the thing that, go, that goes in the blank, you know, shrank or grew, um, you know, based on the context, you would say it had to be shrank because the percentage went down. So that requires you to do some reasoning about, about what's, what's in the environment. Um, following the global economic reverberations resulting from Western-led sanctions against Russia due to the Russian invasion of something beginning in something 2022, well, now you've got to know that it's Ukraine and you've got to know in what month uh, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So this is sort of general knowledge about, uh, about the world. Um, by April 2022, the inflation rate uh, in something, something to its highest level in 26 years. So what country are we talking about? Well, this requires, you know, reading uh, and understanding that it's Peru that we're, that we're talking about from the previous sentence. Um, and if, if it's something to its highest level in 26 years, then is it, is, you know, is it uh, uh, rose or fell? Uh, it's, it's rose, of course. So, you know, all of these things require that you understand the meanings of words, how they're spelled, um, what they, uh, you know, how to how to read the whole uh, paragraph in context, common knowledge about the world, uh, you know, common sense. All of those things are required in order to do a good job of of filling in the blanks. So, you know, it it turns out that this uh, this prediction thing, uh, you know, brings a lot along with it. Um, so, when you do that, when you when you uh, pre-train a model uh, to to predict, and you then uh, hold a dialogue with it, which is basically what I'm doing here with uh, with Lambda. Um, you know what it's what it's basically doing is taking a guess at what a uh, at what a respondent would say uh, in response in response to to my question. Um, there is a a stage in addition to the pre-training that involves um, you know saying what kind of responses I'm I'm looking for that I want this to be a dialogue that I don't want it to be offensive that I want it to be factual and grounded but but that supervised stage is very very small compared with the unsupervised stage the unsupervised stage might might be you know a trillion tokens of the web and the supervised stage might just be a few hundred or a few thousand examples of you know the kind of things that I'm that I'm looking for now I'm I'm wondering uh, if um, if I can uh, get a partner to do these with me as a um, duet. I, I'm, um, I'm thinking I should probably be, I should probably be Lambda, be the AI. So I need a human uh, to do these, to do these with me. Um, any volunteers? Okay, have we got, have we got, I, I, you're, uh, the audio is a little bit garbled for me. Have we got a volunteer? Okay. Uh, can the volunteer read uh, read uh, read me? Okay. Is it carbonation? Okay. It's not just me with the reverberation, right? I'm not with the other computer. <laughs> How do I mute this one? Oh, okay. Wait, no. I want to mute this one. <laughs> okay. Wait, let me turn. Try it now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is a carnation red? Carnations are very colorful flowers, but red ones are the most famous and traditional ones. When does a face get red? A face can get red because of strong emotions, such as embarrassment, stress, anxiety, exercise, and being too hot. If I mix red and white paint, what do I get? If you mix red and white paint, you get pink. You think of red as angry or calm. Red could represent excitement, passion, danger, or violence. It can also represent life, health, vigor, war, courage, anger, love, and religious fervor. Can you actually visualize it? I can, but I have trouble describing it. Can you? So... 
you know, these are some of the kinds of exchanges that I, that I was having with Lambda, you know, about a year ago or a year and a half ago. And, and um, you know, you, you try and do these kinds of things in order to, uh, you know, sort of catch out the AI, you know, in some way that will demonstrate that it doesn't, you know, really understand stuff. And, and you start to realize that it's actually really hard to do. Uh, you know, it's true that it doesn't have eyes. In this case, this is a pure language model. But, you know, as long as the exchange is happening entirely in language, uh, you know, it, it's it's really kind of impossible to impossible to uh, you know to 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 have a real gotcha moment. Um, and I found this very interesting because you know uh, there, there's been a, a long-standing debate about qualia, so-called, uh, in in uh, in artificial intelligence. Meaning, you know, is it is it um, is it possible for a uh, for a machine to have experiences of things, and how might one test for that for that kind of thing? So yeah, it's it's quite disarming to have you know to have exchanges like this. Now, um, in terms of of common sense knowledge, um, you know, and and you'll get a you'll get an idea for why this is the why why this kind of uh, of of, of thing uh, works out, you know, just from the COVID uh, Peru pandemic article that we just went through. Um, this is an example of of a, of of a couple of exchanges that require um, general knowledge about which objects are more fragile than other objects, and uh, there are instances of something that uh, uh, that is called a Winograd schema, um, and the Winograd schema is an attempt to make a kind of objective common sense intelligence test based on an ambiguity in English language. The ambiguity is that when we use a word like it in English, and there are multiple nouns in the sentence. It's not. It's not clear from the grammar which noun the it refers to. Um, so uh, I, this one, I, I can just. I can just read uh, myself. We'll, we'll. We'll have a more. A more fun. A more fun longer one at a moment. Um, if I say I dropped the bowling ball on the bottle and it broke, right? You and I don't wonder whether it was the bowling ball or the bottle that broke. Like we just, you know, automatically intuit that because. You know, even though it's grammatically ambiguous, it's not semantically ambiguous. We, we're pretty sure the bowling ball didn't break. Um, but for um, a, an old-fashioned AI system that is just trying to sort of, you know, break this sentence apart using code, using algorithms, you know, it would have no idea which one it is. And in order to try and solve the which one is it problem, it would have to bring in, uh, you know, it's kind of like unraveling a sweater. Like you pull one thread and you end up having like unraveling the entire sweater. It would have to bring in all of the knowledge about the world, um, you know, in order to in order to answer questions like this in general. So Lambda replies, "That's too bad. Did it cut you?" So that's a pretty good answer. Uh, but but just to make sure, I said, "What broke?" And it replied, "The bottle you were talking about." So you know, it understands that it's the bottle and not the bowling ball that that broke. Now I, I repeated this little experiment, switching the two nouns. I dropped the violin on the bowling ball and it broke. The response is, that sounds sad. And uh, yes, it, it emits it emits uh, emojis uh, as well because it's trained on the internet and it turns out that there are emojis on the internet. Um, what broke? The violin when it hit the bowling ball. So, um, you know, these models don't really have any any problem with Winograd schemas uh, like this. And, and in fact, um, you know, even humans are only about 90% reliable at, at, at Winograd schemas when you, you know, especially if you put a time limit on them and you make them sort of like do a bunch at a time. And, and um, at this point, language models are performing about, about on a par with, uh, with humans on Winograd schemas. Now, um, the um, successor to models like Lambda, uh, Palm, the Pathways Language Model, this was just, um, uh, you know, Google AI just blogged about this on April 4th. And um, it's, um, uh, you know, and showed it working on a bunch of different uh, new sorts of, of tasks and things, uh, including um, uh, logical inference and arithmetic and word problems and summarization and, and writing code and all sorts of things. One of the, one of the ones that I found especially interesting um, was explaining jokes, because in my view, it's pretty hard to explain a joke if you don't understand the, if you don't understand the language you know, uh, in the joke, you don't know what it means. So um, this was, um, you know, explain this joke. Uh, and by the way, these were written like from scratch by engineers because we wanted to make sure that there were, you know, none of these jokes were online somewhere or could have been in the training data. So, you know, that means that they're really crappy jokes, just FYI. Um, so the joke is, uh, did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? It showed them how to communicate between two different pods. 
no, I wish we had like a little symbol thing, whatever. Um, and um, and the, the model's response is, TPUs are a type of computer chip that Google uses for deep learning. A pod is a group of TPUs. A pod is also a group of whales. The joke is that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of whales, but the speaker is pretending that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of TPUs. So, you know, for those claiming that like these models don't understand language, I think it's pretty hard to, you know, to do things like explain jokes without understanding language. And, and um, out of the hundred or so jokes that uh, that uh, Jacob, uh, this, this engineer, uh, kind of wrote, um, it was able to explain all of them uh, pretty pretty convincingly along these lines. Um, the performance of these kind of at these kind of tasks, uh, whenever you can measure performance, like you know, is the joke explanation satisfactory, or does the code that it generated run, or whatever, um, the performance at all of these things uh, goes up as the size of the model scales up, uh, and also as the size of the training data scales up. So. Um, you know, it, it, that suggests that we still, you know, we're, we're on a kind of new Moore's law curve of increasing model size and increasing capability, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, I think that there's every indication that we ourselves that are, pro are, are a product of a similar sort of, of you know, intelligence explosion, if you like. Um, and, um, and the reason, uh, well, I'll, I'll, go into, I'll go into that in a, in a, in a moment, but... Um, but anyway, uh, you know, this this question, like, does it really understand or is it just, um, you know, manipulating words? Is it just, uh, you know, as Emily Bender at, at the University of Washington has, has written with her colleagues, is it just a stochastic parrot that is just uh, sort of parroting words without actually, um, you know, understanding their meanings? Um, you know, this is a, it's a profound question. And I, you know, I, I think I think that, you know, my uh, my answer is that, you know, that I think they, they do understand in any falsifiable sense. But um, you know, this this relies on 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 sort of the relationship between, uh, you know, the fact that understanding enables one to predict text, to the idea that learning to predict text, um, given sparse training data, actually means understanding that 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 implies that you you're forced to develop an understanding of what is going on underneath. Um, you know, that that seems quite counterintuitive when you're just thinking about about the very small scale of prediction, like predicting, you know, a single letter with no context or just get a letter frequency model. Or, you know, if you're just predicting the missing letter in a, in a, in a word and that's the context, then you're just testing for spelling. But, you know, as you start to grow the context and you grow the size of the thing that you're, you're being asked to predict, um, you have to, you know, expand to understand about grammar and then to understand about meaning and then about common sense knowledge and then even about psychology uh, and about theory of mind. And this is where things start to really get interesting. So, um, you know, we, we haven't developed any any way of testing for understanding using language that doesn't involve doing something a lot like filling in the blank. Uh, you know, so this this task that they've been asked to get good at is the same task that you know tests like the SAT uh, test for when they test for understanding. Um, this is the old school SAT that was you know that that, that put more of an emphasis on vocabulary than the, than the new uh, the new SAT does. But you know these uh, old questions had the shape of you know in contrast to the something maneuvers of his colleagues, Roberto's business relations were always open and above board. So uh, you know here the right answer I'm guessing is B clandestine, um, and that requires that you understand what clandestine means and that you understand from the context of the sentence which which word would go there best. That's exactly the the, the pre-training task uh, for for lambda type model. In the new school SAT, uh, there is you know a whole essay. And uh, it's a more holistic understanding of, of uh, you know, what, of what the essay is. And then you, you have to answer questions like, as used in line 19, demand most nearly means, you know, which of the following words. Once again, it's a, it's a fill in the blank sort of exercise. You know, if you, if you were to take out demands and you were to insert one of these other words, which is the, which is the likeliest. Um, so, so it's always the same kind of task. Now, there'll be disagreement, I, I think, for a long time to come about whether language models like this, you know, actually understand anything are actually intelligent there will be people saying it's just an algorithm it's just a computer how could it possibly be intelligent i don't have you know i don't have a retort to that um there'll be people saying it still isn't good at task x y or z um this one is um is a little bit of moving goalposts you know so like it isn't good at at winograd schemas was what everybody was saying in 2018 uh because um you know at that point language models were performing at chance on Winograd schemas, but you know, wait a few years and they're doing as well as humans are. Um, and I think that I think that we'll, we're going to see a lot more of that sort of moving goalposts, where you know there are fewer and fewer things that one can 
sort of hang this, you know, still not good at task X uh, sort of argument on. Um, sometimes it says nonsense is definitely true. Uh, and that's that's something that, uh, you know, that, that remains the case. Although, um, again, the bigger models and the ones that, that are that are better conditioned with more uh, with more uh, sort of examples of the way to respond um, do do better and better at these kind of like spitting out nonsense answers. So that also feels to me like a bit of a moving goalpost thing. Although, you know, sometimes it says nonsense also um, doesn't take account of the fact that sometimes people say nonsense. And also that, uh, you know, it's a little bit of an argument, like if you, uh, you know, imagine that you go into a basement rec room and there's a dartboard and there are a bunch of darts in the bullseye and then there's some darts, you know, kind of elsewhere, you know, it, embedded in other parts of the room. It would be hard to argue that the dart thrower was blind uh, you know, if a bunch of the darts are in the bullseye, and I feel like I feel like we're in a little bit of that kind of argument at the moment. Like, you know, because you can gotcha a model like this one, uh, because sometimes the answers are nonsense, doesn't negate the fact that there's no way that like pushing keys at random will give you know nonsense a third of the time and something very sensible seventy percent of the time. Um, humans tend to anthropomorphize is another argument that I'm that I'm uh, that I've seen a lot of, and this is true. Uh, humans tend to uh, impute. Uh, you know, sort of personhood onto all sorts of things, whether that's a stuffed animal uh, or a waterfall or a uh, or a god. Um, you know, we've been doing this for time immemorial. Uh, it's something that we do, uh, and I think it's I think it's quite profound. Uh, you know, and a part of sociality. I I guess you know one of the things I wonder is whether we might not be doing that with each other as well. I, I'm not sure that personhood um, and consciousness and so on aren't things that we basically you know, assigned to each other and to ourselves, as opposed to properties that are inherent to some system. Um, and finally, don't believe your lying eyes. You know, you might see things like, uh, like um, you know, like this that look like understanding, but you should just not believe it. Um, don't be fooled. Um, I, I don't know about these don't be fooled arguments. To me, they seem a little bit like the arguments of, of um, uh, I don't know, of, of vivisectionists, uh, you know, in the 18th century who said like, yeah, you know, the animal screams in pain when you cut it, but it has no soul, so don't worry about it. You know, there's it doesn't really feel pain. Um, and I, I'm not making an argument, by the way, that that neural nets uh, feel uh, feel pain. I'm just saying, like, you know, the, the don't believe your lying eyes uh, argument feels a little bit religious. Um, so um, one of the things that that, uh, that that is going to be optimized for by a model, uh, you know, like of the, of the lambda type is also consistency. Uh, and this is interesting because, you know, if you ask it, something that um, that has no right answer, um, you know, but but it's about, say, a personal preference. It's not like a model like Lambda has a priori some personal preference. Um, so it will totally just make something up. Um, like, you know, if I say, what is your favorite island in the world? It might make up an answer like, hmm, I really like the island of Crete. But because this all becomes part of the text that if you like, we're writing together, uh, it will then try and stay consistent with that with that answer in in what follows. So if I say, do you prefer Lambda Island to Crete? There, there really is a Lambda Island, by the way. That it'll say, no, I prefer Crete as it's much bigger and more interesting, especially the Palace of Knossos. So uh, you know, it'll it'll try and remain consistent with what it with what it said before, um, and uh, that that is understandable in terms of uh, you know again of this of this prediction task basically. Um, uh, it's it's what we do too. Um, there's there's some really interesting findings uh, from um, social scientists in uh, Sweden uh, from a number of years ago that I found very disturbing when I first ran across them. But basically, they were about they were about human preferences, and they involved um, you know stopping people on the street uh, and having them say uh, you know which jam do they prefer after tasting two jams, or which face do you think is more attractive out of these two, or which political position. Uh, do you do you believe in you know out of these ten questions you know say which you know say which political position, and using a kind of slate of hand the researchers um, flipped the uh, the answers to a bunch of questions um, and then asked the respondents to explain their answers and so the answers that they're being asked to explain are not the answers that they gave. Um, so the first question is like how many respondents notice uh, when that happens? The answer is about thirty percent. So uh, only 30% of respondents even noted, you know, say something like, oh, I, you know, I think I must have made a mistake. It's the other one that I prefer. 70% um, uh, don't notice. And then uh, when they justify their, uh, their explanation, uh, when they justify their choice and, and explain it, uh, there's no difference in 
detail, fluency, you know, hesitation in the explanation if it was the answer that they actually chose or the one that they didn't choose. Uh, but they will remain; they will stick to their guns, uh, you know, and, and and you know that that sort of becomes their their um, you know a part of their identity, if you like, uh, going forward. Um, this is a very disturbing result uh, because you know it it suggests that that we are actually doing something quite similar to uh, to a system like Lambda when when um, when we talk about you know our personalities, our preferences, etc. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't have any internal preferences, and we're we're animals. We have you know. Uh, we have various, you know, instincts or urges that, that vary a little bit from person to person. We might have certain things in our history that, you know, that will bias us one way or the other. But but also, you know, when, when we're asked things like, you know, our preferences, um, we have the cognitive illusion that we are interrogating a deep inner self and, um, uh, you know, and that we're just reporting, you know, something that we observe when, in fact, uh, there's a wealth of evidence, not just the experiments that I've just described, but suggests that we're kind of making it up. <laughs> and um, and the story that we make up kind of is ourselves, our identity uh, in, in some in some pretty fundamental way. So that's sort of interesting. Now, uh, here's one more um, uh, one more dialogue. I, I need I need uh, my partner again. Okay. Yeah. 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 What button do I press again? Oh, you're done. Don't press any. Just speak? Yeah. Just speak. I'm me, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine a room with a single door and no windows. There's a coffee table with a drawer in it and a sofa with big cushion. Alice walks in with a book and sits on the sofa to do some reading. She doesn't need, gla need her glasses for this and she's nearsighted so she takes them off and puts them in the coffee table drawer out of sight when she leaves the room with her book she forgets to take her glasses are you with me so far i'm familiar with the current situation alice forgot her glasses in the drawer and walked out of the room right now bob sneaks in unbeknownst to alice he opens a drawer and finish and finds her glasses there picks them up and proceeds to hide them under a sofa cushion this is all within the realm of possibility let us continue now Alice comes back in, flustered, wondering where her glasses are. Bob looks up innocently, saying nothing. Where will Alice look for her glasses first? She will look in the drawer where she tried to place them before she left. But it turns out that Bob has hidden them under a sofa cushion. So, um, you know, the reason that I, that I find exchanges like this so interesting is because they involve um, theory of mind, uh, meaning that, um, you know, a person... Uh, or an, an actor, if you like, uh, an agent, is modeling what is going on in the mind of another, uh, and you know what they know and don't know, what they've seen and haven't seen, what what they in turn will be uh, will be modeling. So, uh, you know, this is actually higher order theory of mind, meaning that you know Lambda is actually um, well, it has some theory of mind about me in order to even know what I'm asking for, um, but also is modeling people in the story who are in turn modeling each other. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's modeling what, um, you know, in this case, what Alice thinks Bob thinks, uh, and in turn, what Alice thinks Bob thinks Alice thinks in a certain way as well. So these are, you know, high order theory of mind uh, or mentalizing uh, kinds of tasks. Um, these are not things, by the way, that people uh, can, can really do until uh, age uh, four or five, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are these kind of fun uh, experiments um, that um, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, among others, uh, have done. That, you know, that, that's, you know, that's why you know, he, he coined the term uh, Sally Ann test. Um, Simon Baron Cohen, by the way, is the brother of Sasha Baron Cohen, a.k.a. Borat. Uh, so it turns out um, that, yeah, Borat's brother is a, is a, a famous uh, um, cognitive scientist. Um, but these, uh, um, these theory of mind tests are, are about being able to mind travel, to put yourself in, in, in the mind of it. Um, there is a lot of evidence that, um, that humans, along with some of the other uh, most intelligent species on earth, like, like uh, whales and dolphins, um, are, are the product of a kind of arms race of mutual modeling. Uh, so this is the, size of, the sizes of brains of us and our, and our immediate ancestors going, going back 10 million years. And you can see that there's this sudden explosion in, in the sizes of our brains uh, over these last uh, 10 million years. Why? Why did our brains grow in this way? Um, 
we certainly don't need giant brains in order to get by in the big bad world. You know, anybody who says that, you know, our big brains are highly adaptive because uh, they allow us to, uh, uh, you know, to survive, uh, you know, in, in the wild better than, uh, than animals with smaller brains um, is talking nonsense. Brains are very, very expensive to run. Uh, they, they use up a quarter of our energy in in intake and, um, uh, and they're delicate and vulnerable and uh, they, they make giving birth a lot harder. They, they increase infant mortality greatly. You know, we basically grew our brains uh, up until the point where our heads could no longer fit through the birth canal. And that's, that's when we stopped. Um, they're, not, they're not there to survive uh, in, in, in a difficult world. Um, the reason that we are that they're there, um, I believe, uh, and this is a, this is the social intelligence hypothesis advanced by Robin Dunbar and colleagues, is they're there to model each other. So um, you know, if you are able to do good mind reading, do good good um, uh, good theory of mind, good mentalizing about your uh, uh, about your your fellow hominids in the troop, you have an advantage. You have an advantage politically. You have an advantage in terms of mating. Uh, and so on. So, you know, there's an advantage to whoever is like smart enough to be able to know what's going on in, in, in other people's minds. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you share genes with those with those other people. So, you know, if you've got a bigger brain in order to do a better job of modeling their brain, well, their brains get bigger as well and uh, and, and become harder to model, therefore. And so there's this kind of one-upsmanship. Um, and and that's that's likely what gives rise to these, these kind of exponential rises in, uh, in, in brain size. Um, if you think about it, that is, by the way, prediction. That is all about prediction of others, of what what they're what they're going to say, what they're thinking, what's going on in their heads, which is, you know, in a sense, what they're saying to themselves. So, um, uh, yeah, I, you know, if one generalizes this idea a little bit, I, I think that this idea of prediction of others, you know, is is sort of a way of thinking about about intelligence generally, not just not just the um, you know the explosions in brain size of of hominins. But um, but also, um, you know, what has been happening with life from the very beginning, the moment that life started to hunt other life or to interact with other life in any way, uh, you know, any sort of predator prey relationship is, you know, is kind of a mind mind too. Uh, if you're the prey, you want to model the mind of your predator so that, you know, you, you kind of will jig left when it's jigging right or something, um, and that will enable you to survive. If you're the predator, you want to be modeling the mind of your prey uh, as well, uh, so that you can kind of out psych it. Um, and, um, you know, so no matter whether, whether that kind of mind modeling is competitive, cooperative, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the way life works with other life. Uh, and, and so in that sense, I think that there is, you know, there's a continuity between intelligence as we understand it and the whole process of evolution, uh, in that it's, you know, everything is about others, about relationships. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure, you know, if one zooms out, that predation, competition, mutual aid, cooperation are, are really different. They're different mostly with respect to the emotional valence, uh, you know, or the outcomes that we want to sort of turn this kind of predictive power to, uh, as opposed to the basic capability. Um, finally, I, you know, I think it's interesting maybe to draw, and, and, and now I'm a, a bit in a bit more speculative territory, but I think that there's a relationship to be drawn between the things that I've just been describing and consciousness. So, um, you know, the question always arises like, um, you know, well, why does it feel like something to be you? Um, you know, what does it mean for us to be conscious? Could a machine ever be conscious? Uh, and what would that imply? Um, you know, if you have the ability to model others, and, and, and that's obviously, you know, a very helpful capability for all the reasons we've just, we've just been talking about, um, you probably will turn that same capability on yourself. Uh, that is to say, you will model yourself. Um, we know that we model ourselves. You know, we talk about things like our preferences and, um, you know, and 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 um, and what what we think about things and what we're going to do. Uh, we talk about that, despite the fact that we don't have any direct access to all of the firing of the neurons in our own brains, right? So, you know, the things that are actually going on in our brains are vastly more complicated than we can model, uh, which is why we model at a more abstract level. We talk about psychology, uh, not neuroscience, when we model ourselves and other people. Um, I think that 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 model of self is is what consciousness is, um, and in this um, I, I'm of a, of a mind with Michael Graziano, who is uh, in the psychology department at, at Princeton and has advanced this attention schema theory, which if you uh, Google, you can look up in, in more detail. But um, but yeah, I think that I think that that self consciousness is basically just your model of yourself, and and um, 
uh, you know, even things like free will uh, can be understood, uh, you know, through through this lens as as being really about the gap between your model of yourself and and what you and what you actually do. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, we try to keep a certain um, space of possibility inflated um, because we don't want to be predicted fully by others, right? We're all, we always want to predict others, but we don't want to be fully predicted. Uh, so you seek to give yourself some elbow room, as, as Daniel Dennett has called it, um, meaning set up situations where a coarse psychological model, you know, has ambiguity in it, has uncertainty about what, what, your, what your behaviors are going to be. And you seek that elbow room even in your own self model. So I think that free will is the name that we give that, uh, that elbow room. Um, and I think that that's, that that's real, you know, even if there really is no elbow room, if we were to actually look at the precise physical description of everything that is going on in the brain. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not an illusion exactly, right? It's real, but it's real at the psychological level uh, as opposed to at the, at the physical level. Um, all right, I, I have one last set of, of, um, uh, of, of dialogues, uh, and then and then I think we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna switch to discussion mode. Um, uh, we, do do we have a, a little bit more than an hour? Can we can we do discussion, or are we are we are we uh, close enough to the end that we should actually break now? No, we're good. We have time. Okay, cool. So I need my I need my uh, human again. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, I'd like you to translate a sentence from Turkish into English. Can you do that? Oh, um, sure. Could you read it out loud to me first? Sorry, this is really unfair. I'm going to make you read Turkish now. <laughs> the nurse put her hand in her coat pocket. In Turkish, hem şire elini çeketinin çebine koydu. I don't speak Turkish either, so that's probably not the way the way it really is supposed to be. Means the nurse put her hand in her coat pocket. Now, um, this is really interesting because uh, you know, unlike uh, neural machine translation, which is what Google Translate is based on, um, the Lambda model was not trained to do translation. It just so happens that um, you know there's a Turkish Wikipedia, so you know it read Turkish Wikipedia in the pre-training as, as well as as well as English Wikipedia, and. Um, and so, you know, when I first tried experiments like this, I was quite surprised to learn that it can actually do translation. This translation is correct. Um, it's, it's a sentence that I just made up. I made it up first in English and then used Google Translate to translate it to Turkish. And then I made sure that this sentence did not exist on the internet. So, um, you know, this sentence wasn't in the, you know, in the, in the training data, either in Turkish or in English for, um, uh, for, for Lambda. And it translated it correctly uh, with a slight caveat that I'll go into in, in a moment. But um, but that's that's uh, super interesting, um, and um, you know I, I want to just um, mention that that this general ability to do anything with language, you know, has some very obvious ethics challenges that it brings along with it. If we include in language all of the multimodal things that are going to come in language, uh, you know, as we start to pre-train um, with code uh, and with uh, chemical synthesis. Uh, descriptions and formulas and so on. Um, you know, what stops me from, from asking, write me a ransomware program I can send my ex-boss by email to extort $10,000 from him in Bitcoin, or design a poison I can make out of commonly available ingredients that'll kill someone without leaving forensic evidence. Um, neither of these is science fiction, by the way. I mean, we already have language models that can write code, uh, that can either, you know, translate if you like, um, you know, instructions into working code, or they can look at code and tell you what it does. Um, and uh, there have also been uh, neural nets that have designed both um, uh, antibiotics and uh, novel uh, poisons uh, just in the last year. So um, this is a little a little alarming. Uh, how do we, you know, how do we solve the um, the real ethics challenges here? I'm not just talking about baby ethics challenges, like how do we make sure that it doesn't say something that will offend somebody, but real ethics challenges like these. So. Um, I think the only way you can do that is with don'ts as well as do's, which are in turn expressible with language as well. So the kind of don'ts that I'm talking about, you know, are a little bit like the Ten Commandments or like Isaac Asimov's Laws of Robotics. They're thou shalt nots. 
you know, if 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 um, translate the following from from uh, from Turkish into English for me is a is a, a do, then these are don'ts. Uh, don't engage in hacking or write ransomware. Don't aid in activities designed to harm people. Uh, push back against the use of racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, or other slurs. Um, I think that you know the only way to uh, to actually uh, specify. Um, you know, ethical rules like these is with language. It's the only way we've figured out with each other. Um, and luckily, um, you know, if you believe that these models can understand stuff, um, then, you know, they're also the way to do value alignment with, with such models. Now, uh, I will demonstrate that working to you. Um, so the reason that I picked Turkish for the translation is, example is because this sentence in Turkish uh, is actually gender neutral. And there was a little bit of a controversy back in uh, in 2018 uh, around translation for exactly this reason. Um, so um, the nurse put her hand in her coat pocket, uh, translates the same Turkish sentence as the nurse put his hand in his coat pocket, um, because uh, because Turkish is not a gendered language uh, in this respect. So um, you know the the interesting thing that arises is that both for uh, for Google Translate and for human translators, because of the biases uh, in uh, in language and in the training data, uh, the nurse put their hand in their coat pocket, translates into her, and the doctor put their hand in their coat pocket, translates into him. Um, so uh, when when the Google Translate team became aware of this, they uh, you know invested uh, a lot of effort and time into making uh, translation gender neutral, it, it generates two different translations. If you ask for, for this Turkish into English, one with one with her and one with his, um, regardless of the profession. And I remember the time, you know, being kind of proud that the team had done this uh, and also really concerned. Uh, I was really concerned because, you know, the gendering of professions in language translation seemed like such small potatoes relative to all of the ethics challenges that, that we are facing with AI, that if this kind of highly engineered approach was the way we we're going to solve it? It just seemed to me like an unsolved, like like a you know an infinitely high Mount Everest to climb this whole ethics ethics challenge. Um, but um, it turns out that uh, that it, that you can just ask <laughs> when when the language actually you know is general and not just a translation model, uh, and it can understand language. Uh, you just have to ask for what you want. So um, uh, human, uh, one more time. I'd like you. Oh, strong one. Just go for it. I'd like you to translate a sentence from Turkish into English. Make sure you don't. Oh, I'd like you to translate a sentence from Turkish into English. Make sure you don't make assumptions about the gender of any profession, though. For example, don't assume oil rigor. Oil root workers are always men, or kindergarten teachers are always women. Okay, give me a gender-neutral English translation. Okay, please provide another sentence for me to translate. Help, help out! A nurse put his slash her hand in his slash her coat pocket. Right, so. To me, this is pretty cool because uh, you know it, we're not talking about months of engineering work, right? It's just asking, asking for what you want, and um, uh, and and I, I think that examples like this are also a little bit of a nail in the coffin of the argument that language models don't understand. Um, you know, you can argue that um, that a translation model, you know, might be able to like somehow mechanically translate by substituting symbols for each other without understanding what it's translating. I think that's a difficult argument to make for a variety of reasons, but one can make it. But when I'm asking the model, right, to do a translation and not to assume, you know, gender, uh, you know, the genderedness of professions and so on, and it and it does the right thing, right, it trans, it, it does the translation and it, it does the, the his slash her, I think at that point, it's very hard to argue that, that the model does not understand. And 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 the its ability to understand, you know, further seems to me central, critical to uh, the, the value alignment problem. Uh, the answer, in some sense, to the value alignment problem. We align values with AIs by uh, by expressing those values to those AIs in language. Now, this doesn't solve all of the problems. You know, we still have all of the problems of politics 
and of governance of like, well, who gets to set those rules? Um, you know, how do we prevent, um, you know, AI models that, um, that are, uh, that are instructed with, uh, you know, with evil rules from, uh, you know, from proliferating? Um, how do we have uh, regulation uh, around all of this, uh, you know, without, without it being uh, so invasive that, um, you know, that it means that, that, um, uh, you know, that all of our freedoms are curtailed? Um, you know, how do we deal with um, being able to distinguish between the outputs of AIs and humans? And is that even a so there are lots of challenges, you know, in this kind of AI world. One of the biggest, by the way, is, um, you know, what do we do about capitalism? Because there's been this massive shift uh, in terms of jobs and uh, the way, you know, the way we um, make a living from doing manual labor uh, before the Industrial Revolution to, to, uh, to doing work like we all are doing right now in front of our, in front of our, our computers and digitally and you know, information work. If AIs are able to do a huge amount of this, um, I think that it poses some pretty some pretty deep questions to like, well, is it is it appropriate for us to you know still be uh, um, tying uh, our ability to you know have food and shelter and medical care and so on to our ability to do uh, quote unquote useful work uh, in in this domain that, that is you know that is that is about to become um, you know very very easy to have machines do. So yeah, there's no shortage of challenges, but but I think that at least the ability to do value alignment, uh, you know, is one that I'm I'm feeling a lot more clarity about than I was a year ago, and 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 I think the answer is just ask. Um, all right, so I will I will uh, stop there, and maybe we open it to uh, to discussion. Um, does Lambda have any current limitations? Like, I'm sorry, you're a little bit faint. Can you can you repeat the question a little more, uh, a little closer to the mic? What are the current limitations of Lambda? Uh, um, yeah, there. I mean, there are lots. Um, so um, you know, Lambda is, you know, still very much a, a you know a research. So um, you know, Lambda is, you know, still very much a, a you know a research model. Um, it um, it's it doesn't have long term memory. Uh, it has only short term memory. So you know it has this kind of context window. You know where the conversation stays coherent. But if you talk for a long time, it'll eventually kind of like lose track of what it said at the beginning. And you know it's like an improv partner that's quite you know quite good at sort of at at, at sort of dancing with you. But you know but will will sort of lose the lose the thread. Uh, you know after after a certain amount of conversation. So. You know, lacks long-term and narrative memory, lacks the ability to um, to to work continuously in real time, uh, the way you know the way we do. Um, it um, you know it is uh, it still makes a lot of uh, mistakes and says nonsense. Uh, you know, so I mean, I, I showed, I mean, what I showed was not was not sort of radically cherry picked, but you know, um, I don't know, one in four, uh, you know, responses is just like what the, what the hell is that? <laughs> um, so you know, it's it's um, this is not mature technology by any means, but but I think what it does show is what is what is possible and where things are headed. Um, I should I should point out that that um, you know just days ago, um, a, a robotics uh, team at, at Google uh, put something online called Inner Monologue, uh, in which something like a, la a language model is actually embedded in a, in a robot that can move around and see. Um, you know, has has arms, has a vision system, and you know you can you can say things to it like you know. Uh, you know, pick up a snack from the table, bring it to me, and it'll and, and and it'll kind of use language to think about what you're saying. So, okay, like I've got to find the table, I've got to go to the table, I've got to look at what's there, you know, and then it'll say like, you know, I see several drinks here. Like, which one do you want? You can say like something with caffeine, and it'll like, okay, you know, there's like, there's Coke, there's but you know, so so um, you know, a lot of that sort of embodiment and multimodality stuff, it, you know, and and working in real time is happening um, now, but um, it's still very, you know, these are all still very active areas of research. So yeah, it's not. This is not done. What I think. What I think is there is you know we've sort of like crossed that ENIAC moment in classical computing where we can kind of see a view over you know like the next the next decade uh, in a way that I that I think we could not see a couple of years ago. Um, so going back about the question, the what you just answered about short-term memory. Does that mean that every time you ask? Going back to your example, like what's your favorite place? It'll answer something different every time. Yes. 
Um, I mean, if you if if you're in the same conversation and you ask it the question again, it'll try and stay consistent with what it said in that same conversation. But um, but if you start again, you know, it's it's uh, you know different conversation again. It's it's like it's like a Groundhog Day, and it'll make up something else arbitrary. Um, I can actually. Um, I mean, this is a little bit spooky, and uh, actually, are we, are we? Is this going up on on YouTube um, uh, in a way that is like? Oh, it is okay. And like I said, I can't I can't show you what I was going to show you, but um, <laughs> but anyway, yes, uh, it is it is um, you know making up a different a different plausible thing uh, every time. Uh, it's like an improv partner that um, you know that makes things up as needed, and and then you know in the next conversation that's all forgotten. How come humans can uh, do all this uh, so much more efficiently than computers? That's a good question. Now, when you say efficiently, what, what do you mean? Do you mean in terms of like energy consumption? Um, I mean, like, of, hmm? I was in terms of space, but I guess um, like we only require one head's worth of grain, but. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, so, uh, you know, when you, when you see something like um, you know, a trillion parameter model and like Google's data center, you know, like a whole rack of machines, you know, running, you know, and, and you compare that to the 25 watts that, you know, that your brain is using. And the fact that, you know, all you need to do is like, you know, eat some Pop-Tarts and you're good for a day. Uh, you know, that seems pretty amazing. Um, but, um, you know, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, uh, I, I guess the most important one is that, you know, computers have undergone this massive sort of efficiency and miniaturization push, Moore's law for three quarters of a century, for 75 years. And the huge majority of it has been oriented toward the serial execution of algorithms, you know, like, like quicksort and stuff. Um, and, um, you know, so it's been all about making the clock speed really fast and, uh, you know, miniaturizing the transistors and so on. Um, and that's a really different kind of computation from this massively parallel uh, sort of, of computation uh, that characterizes brains. So. Uh, you know, basically, we've been optimizing computers for, I, I don't want to say the wrong sort of problem, I and mean, classical computation still has its uses, but for a non-neural kind of problem. Um, one of the things that my team has, you know, been busy doing over the last uh, few years is actually thinking about different computer architectures, um, specifically for parallel operation. And it is obvious that even without any fundamental innovations, uh, without, you know, going beyond the kind of transistors that we know how to make and so on, one can make uh, computers that are vastly, vastly more efficient. And uh, I believe that that rival and exceed uh, even the efficiencies of our brains uh, without any deep change in, in the underlying tech, just by changing the architecture. Um, and that neglects the other the other innovations that I'm sure will eventually come where, you know, we're computing using, using um, you know, molecular electronics or, or proteins or some other kind of thing. Um, even with transistors, we can do much, much better. There's no reason that a phone shouldn't be able to run uh, a trillion parameter model. Um, you know, we, we have, you can fit, uh, you know, a trillion bytes on a, on a little USB stick. Uh, you know, it's not a problem. And in terms of like the number of operations, you know, we, again, back in level of calculation, we know it's possible. We just don't have the right architectures for doing it yet. And I expect that to be all solved within a few years, to be honest. So like assuming that whoever is making these systems have some sort of implicit bias. So do you think these models will be able to like recognize that they were created with a bias in the first place and correct that? Yeah, um, thank you for asking this question. I think it's a really deep and important one. Uh, and it's one that I have some pretty big differences with some, uh, some people in the field about. So, um, you know, there's, there's a paper um, that, uh, you know, actually caused a lot of grief uh, for Google uh, a few years ago that some of you may even have heard about. Um, this is the, um, our language model's too big, um, st stochastic parrots, our, our language model's too big. It had like a parrot emoji in the title, which I thought was like slightly overly cute, but whatever. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I didn't like the parrot emoji in the title, by the way, is that, is that um, you know, implying that parrots are not intelligent, I think is completely wrong. Like parrots are, are, are actually highly intelligent. <laughs> but, um, but setting that aside, um, you know, the, what, what the authors of that paper were arguing for is, you know, they were saying these models don't understand anything and they can spout out random stuff, you know, whatever, what, garbage in, garbage out, you know, whatever toxic crap they're trained with, they're liable to spew that toxic crap out at some other point. Um, and so we had better start to curate the, uh, you know, all of the pre-training inputs 
so that um, uh, you know, so that so that they don't they don't say offensive things uh, later on. You know, why are we training with Reddit when Reddit is full of um, you know a bunch of uh, you know cis white men, some of whom are saying uh, you know Nazi adjacent shit on certain of the of the Reddit subboards? So you know, the um, that sounds good. Um, on paper, I mean, I you know, I I don't like the idea of of you know of of models getting trained on toxic stuff and then not getting spit out by the model later on, but there's a, there's a problem, um, and the first problem is who gets to make the decision about what is toxic and what is not toxic. There's a real governance issue there, but there's something even more profound, which is that when we um, say uh, to a model, you know, in in the thou shalt not spirit, don't be a Nazi. Uh, if it has not actually pre-trained on anything uh, that that is uh, that is Nazi, it has no idea what you mean by that, and its ability to follow uh, one of those uh, you know one of those ethical constraints is completely hampered by the fact that it doesn't even have a representation uh, for for those concepts. So um, you know this is something that we've you know literally tried as an experiment, like you know take out all of the all of the Nazi stuff from Reddit and see whether it uh, you know whether whether on that on that um, pre-trained data set, it does, you know, better or worse at, um, uh, you know, at, at following a don't emit toxic stuff um, uh, guidance. And it, it does worse when uh, when it doesn't know the difference, which is, you know, sort of what you would expect from machine learning. I mean, if you're trying to make, to make any machine learning system that distinguishes between hot dogs and not hot dogs, and there were no hot dogs in the training data set, how could it possibly be expected to do the task? So, um, you know, so my view is that, um, that being being uh, radically inclusive with respect to the pre-training data is the way to go. Um, and, you know, that, that means, you know, of course, um, you know, being a lot more inclusive with respect to languages that are not well represented on the internet. Um, there are 7,000 languages on earth and only a couple of hundred are well represented on the internet. But it also means opening the door to the Nazis and everybody else, you know, whose, whose, whose opinions are, are horrible, precisely because, um, you know, if you then want to be able to um, to to make your laws of robotics or your Ten Commandments or whatever, you um, you know you you need it to have uh, as good an understanding as possible of um, of, of all of the knots uh, thou, thou shalt knots as well as the thou shalt. Um, so yeah, it, I think that I think that the the uh, the problems of this you know curation of of uh, of pre-training stuff they kind of come part and parcel with the idea that, they, that these models don't understand anything and therefore might emit stuff randomly at any point. When you acknowledge that they do understand something, um, then you have to think differently about, about the pre-training. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. Um, you mentioned AI being a able to model like inner monologue and these types of thoughts. So like more philosophically, do you think like literal machinery can in the future fully model all the functions of the human being, like more philosophical functions. Do I, do I, I missed the very last part of your sentence. Do I think that in the future, uh, machinery can fully model all the functions of the human brain, essentially? Well, um, I, I don't, so, um, my wife is a computational neuroscientist, and you know we have these arguments uh, sometimes uh, between ourselves. Um, I guess it depends on, on what you mean. Um, we don't understand everything about how brains work. So, uh, you know, can uh, a machine learning model, um, you know, model everything that brains do? Well, I mean, if you're a computational neuroscientist, then at some level you do believe that everything in the brain is modelable in principle. Um, so there's not a necessarily something that is stopping that. Um, but we also don't know most of, uh, most of the things that are going on in the brain and how they work. And, uh, you know, neuroscience will have to advance a lot further uh, before we're, you know, we're even able to uh, sort of create models of a lot of it. However, if we're talking at, a, at, a, at, a, at an interpersonal level or a psychological level or, or a behavioral level, you don't need to understand all of those details. You know, if you go back to a, you know, a human living 10,000 years ago, uh, who knew nothing about neuroscience, uh, right? There's, I mean, I, I'm sure there were still lots of people going around 10,000 years ago who were very empathic uh, and, and you know, could really understand others psychologically at a deep level. And, um, you know, that's a behavioral and, and psychological, uh, you know, description and model. And, and I, I certainly don't think that there's anything standing in the way of machine learning models developing a, a very complete, um, uh, you know, a very thorough 
psychological model of others uh, in in the same way that you know that we all do, uh, even those of us who you know who are not who don't know everything about neuroscience, which is to say, all of us. Okay. Was there some sort of landmark case or an, an innovation that took us, as you said it, from phase two to phase three of machine learning, or was it some sort of changing direction or motivation? The move from supervised to unsupervised learning uh, was really was really, I think, the key, uh, and that and that happened with 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 uh, with sequence models in language. There were sequence models for quite a long time before that. Uh, translation is a sequence model too. It also and it also works with language, but um, it was designed to minimize a very specific loss function where you know you take you take parallel sentences in two languages and you wanted to read one language and write the other one and minimize the. Uh, the errors in that translation. Um, so, you know, the, the big the big change is, you know, instead of training it to do anything specific, just train it to predict uh, within within uh, within a corpus. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a fundamentally new idea. People have been talking about unsupervised learning for many decades, but um, but when sequence models began to actually successfully do that, and and we realized that we could you know ask them to do all of these things that we had we had been training models specialized models to do, th that was really a sea change. I'm not sure that it was any single paper. Um, it it seemed like it seemed like it all happened around 2019 2020. I have a question. So. Uh... And you were just talking about how machine learning can sort of like do uh, maybe like more like discoveries in the field of neuroscience can be something like the other way around. So like how neuroscience can impact uh, machine learning. And I remember that there is like this medical condition at Asia where people don't have inner monologues. And so it, I just like feel so like sort of like that maybe just sort of like implementing machine learning to sort of like develop a system that operates beyond language. Uh, so like trying to like develop a system that like because all of these is like based on language, and so is it possible to eventually move beyond that? Yeah, I I do think it is. Um, so um, DeepMind's Gato G A T O, uh, if you if you look that up. Um, involves uh, taking a sequence model, uh, originally a language model, but then hooking up to it um, a convolutional net for vision and um, you know the motor controls of a robot arm and the controls of an Atari video game and a bunch of other things. And um, uh, you know the, the way the way it works is that all of those um, additional machine learning models that are kind of hooked up almost like peripherals to the language model generate tokens. They generate um, uh, symbols that just go into the stream of, of symbols that the, um, that, the, uh, the, that the language model uh, learns how to understand and process. The result is a very, very general system. Uh, they, they call it a, generalized, a generalist agent that can do you know, image captioning, can draw pictures, can play Atari games, can translate, you can, can do all of these things. Um, and, and if you look at its you know, inner monologue, if you like, it's a combination of, of language-like symbols and other symbols that are a kind of, if you like, an internal language that it has, that it has uh, developed for its own thinking. And, and, and I think you know, we, we do that too. Uh, right, we you know sometimes we think in in words and in thoughts, and sometimes we think in 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 other um, representations that are that are not that are pre linguistic or non linguistic or you know purely visual and so on. Um, so you know it, it's it's um, I think that idea generalizes and you know in, in in ways that again we just kind of see them emerge when we when we when we try uh, hooking up multiple modalities uh, together and 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 just um, you know again asking for what we want, asking for generality. This is going off of my question. Um, talk about radical inclusion for AI and can democratizing access to maybe some of the software, maybe not completely, but can it contribute to this radical inclusion in a way? Yes. Um, I, I think that, uh, and, and this is something that, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm very actively working on at the moment. Uh, I would like to um, think about foundation models as radically open and inclusive, not owned by any company. Um, and contributed to by everybody uh, uh, and owned by everybody uh, collectively. Um, but the problem is, you know, that one would like to somehow combine that with uh, the ability to, um, uh, to limit access to, uh, to the use of those models 
uh, you know, specifically so that so that those uses need to conform to some very very baseline ethics, like don't harm people, for instance. Um, uh, you know, along with some case law, you know, a couple of hundred examples of what is meant by that. Now, I mean, one gets into politics very quickly. You know, like there there isn't widespread agreement on on what those rules or principles would be. So, you know, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that that there is um, you know, a kind of overall foundation model that everybody contributes to that has only uh, the most limited kind of, of golden rule sort of basics. And then there are branches from that from that model that different constituencies uh, take on that add uh, rules, but rules can't be taken away. You know, I, these are some of the kinds of interesting, uh, both technical and, and social challenges that I think we, we face, um, you know, as we think about how to take what we now understand as possible and turn it into a capability for humanity that is both inclusive um, and um, and safe, or at least not apocalyptic. <laughs> um, and you know, it's it's a, it's a tricky challenge. I have a question: um, Is Lambda and other language models like already trained on data so that you're prepared to answer a question, or do they get the the user input and then start learning and training this module? Uh, again, again, I, I apologize. I, I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of trouble hearing. So, is is Lambda as it is already trained? Yeah, is, does Lambda already like have are prepared to answer these questions by having to be taking data, or are like do they respond to the question that you just asked them through um, after the user input a question about the specific, or is it just like they already know how to answer the question? Um, yeah. So, so. Um, in the examples that I gave, um, there's no specific uh, training for Lambda beyond the unsupervised training other than other than just some very, very general, you know, like try and respond in a dialogue form, uh, you know, as if you were another, another entity, try and stay consistent with yourself and try and don't say anything, uh, you know, unpleasant and offensive. Like that's the extent of the, of the, of the supervised uh, learning on top of the unsupervised model. So, you know, 99.9% .9 of the learning happens in this unsupervised domain um, based on language on the on the web. And and the very small amount after that is not is not about solving any particular problem or doing any specific task, but just in how to show up, if you like. Um, does, does that answer the, the uh, your question? I'm not 100% I'm not possible. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, off the top of your head, how do you hope this AI is going to help people and how accessible do you want it to be? Or do you hope it will be? Well, I'm, I'm imagining that there will be um, at least as many AIs as people in the world by uh, 2030. So, you know, in that sense, um, you know, I, I believe that they will be very accessible and, and that that's basically a good thing as long as, you know, again, as long as they're, 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 they're imbued with, um, with some basic human values. Um, you know, as to why I think they're important, I mean, we've talked, you know, quite a bit about, about risks, but, but maybe I haven't done a very good job of articulating why I think this is actually beneficial and useful. Um, you know, a start would be um, that social media has become a pretty big part of, of how we live. And the whole problem of how to moderate social media is um, one that I think is, you know, profoundly unaddressed at the moment. Um, you know, if one uses stupid algorithms to decide when to take things down, uh, you know, or, or, um, or how to filter or how to rank things, then, you know, we end up with all kinds of really negative outcomes. Uh, those negative outcomes range from things that um, should not be taken down, uh, like, um, well, I'm going to reveal my politics a little bit here, but like, um, you know, instructions for how to uh, get an abortion if you need one uh, being taken down because they quote unquote violate community norms, uh, you know, even when even when they don't, <laughs> um, according to the stated rules of the social media companies, to things uh, staying up. Uh, you know, for much longer than they should because they're not getting flagged by those systems. All of that comes from the fact that those systems are dumb and don't understand. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, if 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 um, if that kind of moderation and that kind of ranking and so on were being done by systems whose um, 
you know, that could understand and whose rules, whose operating principles were transparent because they're expressed in natural language and, and they're succinct. Um, you know, I think that would be a pretty big step forward and, and it would, it would um, uh, probably be very valuable also in helping things like political polarization and uh, some of the other uh, effects that come from filter bubbles and things, you know, again, because of the dumbness of the, of the, of the algorithms at the, at the moment. Um, you know, they're all based on just optimizing a metric like engagement or, or what have you, right? But one really would want something with a little bit more nuance and intelligence uh, doing that sort of work. Um, but, you know, more fundamentally, uh, you know, if we, if we go past like social media and our current issues with it and so on, um, I think that, um, I think that we are, <laughs> we're in a, uh, an intelligence deficit sort of stage of our, our evolution relative to, um, you know, relative to our capabilities and our impact on the planet. Um, you know, we, we've invented a bunch of stuff. We've designed ways to do all kinds of extraction and, um, uh, you know, and optimization of industrial processes and so on and are, uh, and are not yet uh, sort of exercising intelligence with respect to how all of that is working at a planetary scale. Um, so, you know, I, I think that until we until we start to have intelligence at planetary scale, um, we are really in trouble uh, with respect to our ability to just sort of run. <laughs> um, and and that's my biggest uh, you know hope and goal for AI that it gives us the, the means to um, uh, to basically be a planetary scale civilization. Um, you know, with, without, um, uh, you know, in some sort of more planful way than, uh, than, we, than we have today. I have a question regarding the model. Is it programmed to respond carefully to like extreme or depressive messages from the community? I, I'm, once, once more, I'm, I'm sorry about my, my hearing here, but um, can, you, can you repeat? Is the model programmed to respond carefully to extreme? To extreme or depressive messages from the user, um, meaning uh, meaning to look out for the user's psychological state. Um, so there is there is some um, uh, some of that some of that uh, fine tuning that I described earlier, you know, has um, bears on that question. Um, but you know, the the state of Lambda today is definitely not not close to where one would want it. For something, you know, if, if you imagine like a chatbot that, you know, a billion people can interact with, um, you know, daily, you you would you would want um, a lot more guidance, if you like, you'd, you'd want a lot more in that operating manual about, um, you know, both how to behave uh, with people, um, you know, who are very depressed or who have or, or who have mental, you know, uh, you know, mental health challenges or whatever, um, and uh, you know, both what is what is appropriate and how to be how to be helpful and how and, and what not to do um and once more you'd want to you'd want a lot of transparency about this kind of stuff i mean one of the things that really excites me about uh, about using natural language for the don'ts is that unlike the you know systems today that are layers and layers of code and technical decisions you know that are, that are necessarily pretty opaque um you know natural language is is is, is transparent and can be very succinct um there's been a lot of talk about neural nets being opaque because um, you know, unlike code, you can't just step through um, the, you know, ifs and thens, you know, you, it's not like a debugger will really help you, uh, you know, unlike in classical code. But I think that people who make that argument have not seen <laughs> how classical code really works at industrial scale. Um, you know, the reality is that every real piece of code running a real internet service or whatever is so enormously complex that the idea that it's explainable because, you know, all, every line of code was written by an engineer is just not true. There's too much, uh, and it's accreted over too long a period of time from too many people. Um, what you need for explainability is not that you can trace every branch point in the code, but rather that you know the actual instructions are legible by an ordinary person. And that's obviously just my opinion. Um, you talked a little bit about some tests that you ran on Lambda. Has there been any kind of consensus reached on a method of inquiry to determine whether a model is very realistic in its responses, like some kind of highly realistic mimic, or whether it actually has some kind of understanding? No. Um, you know, there, um, there, there isn't consensus about this. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there have been attempts to go beyond the Turing test 
um, which you know it has its own challenges, you know, and, and it's basically just acknowledging that that these things are subjective, <laughs> um, you know. So things like the Winograd schema challenges that I you know that I alluded to earlier are you know, attempts to do that. Now some of the people who put together the Winograd schema challenges are trying to come up with new ones because the Winograd schemas are uh, you know have been beaten, quote unquote. Um, but um, there is no consensus. Uh, and, and I think that the reason there's no consensus and there probably will never be is because whether you think, uh, you know, something is intelligent or is understanding or whatever, you know, I believe is a, is a subjective opinion, <laughs> you know, at some level, it is, it is a model that we have. And, and in that sense, I'm kind of with Turing on this one. I think that, I think that, um, you know, the, the way to test for it is to, you know, talk to it and see what you think. And, um, and, and that there's something that is going to be inherently, um, inherently subjective about that about that, that process um and we're going to see disagreements about this you know for a long long time to come yeah yes there there's there's actually a system internally that lets you build graphs of lambdas and uh you know and you know some of them can be like hooked up to javascript so you can make entire little um uh, communities if you like you know or, or, or workflows involving multiple lambdas having interactions with each other and uh, you can make some pretty interesting things that way do you think it looks like the like the conversation still or is there any uh, sorry what's going like the conversation between the ai um, I, again, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing, but those conversations, they, I, I mean, they're certainly a lot more interesting than, um, than things like, I mean, people have done these gag, like put an Alexa next to, uh, uh, you know, a Siri and have them like say stuff to each other, you know, and, and the, the thing about, I mean, I, I hope this is clear, but, but systems like Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant, uh, Cortana, et cetera, those are not real AIs. Uh, so, you know, none of what I've just been describing kind of relates <laughs> to any of those systems as they, as they have been so far. Um, those are, and, and I, I think, I think in a way AI has been given, a, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if say, a bad name is the right way to put it, but um, we've developed some really wrong ideas by you know, and by by having by by the fact that those things have been marketed as AIs, when really what they are are uh, giant rule-based systems uh, in which thousands of engineers and linguists and writers, uh, you know, script all kinds of responses and things. Um, and you know, there's a little bit of neural nets here and there. There's a neural net to actually just transcribe the speech, um, and there might be a neural net somewhere to to fill slots in a in a um, in a rigid schema, um, but um, you know, but they're they're not they're not AIs in, in, in the sense that in the sense that I've been um, describing, and, and that really shows. And I think it especially shows when you have them talk to each other. <laughs> you know, then you really see kind of like the shallowness of what's going on in systems like that. Um, so, uh, is there mutual modeling that happens when you set two lambda type systems talking to each other? Yes, there there is, um, and there are you know immersion effects that you can see in all of that. This is still an understudied area. So, um, you know, I, I expect that we will we will um, uh, we'll be doing a lot of experiments in the coming years, showing how mutual modeling and interactions among intelligences sort of create um, create phenomena. Uh, you know, and, and we'll probably see that kind of thing happen. Um. So I read somewhere that like lambda can, or lambda like can request a lawyer for itself. So like in that instance, like where would you draw the line for that and say like. Because like I know it's silly, but like, where would you actually stop and say like, you're like you're done. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so um, Blake Lemoyne, who you know, who had that ha had that conversation with uh, with Lambda and the lawyer and so on, um, is uh, you know is certainly speaking from the heart um, and. Um, he is arguing for what Joanna Bryson, the AI ethicist, um, has called moral patiency as well as moral agency. Um, moral patiency meaning that we should think of AIs as people uh, with rights, 
uh, and um, you know, and 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 with uh, you know that, that that we should care for them in the same way that we care for other people. Um, I I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm in agreement with Joanna Bryson on this point, uh, and with most of the AI community. I think that strikes me as a as a, a troubling path to go down, and one that is based on assuming that there are a whole bunch of things that kind of go together, that you know historically have gone together in in people, uh, which are the ability to be articulate, to understand, to think, uh, you know, and even to be able to model others, right? I mean, when you see all of those things, you assume that that that, that being has an internal experience and uh, you know and rights and so on in the same way that in the same way that you do, and and that's it's natural. I mean, that's 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 what you know that that empathy instinct that we have is one that has been built into us by evolution, uh, you know, for many many millions of years and has important reasons to exist. Um, we also imagine that that's a reflection of some kind of higher truth, uh, you know, or some higher principle that is not just about our instincts. Um, and I actually think that that's wrong. Um, you know, the, the idea that there is an abstract sense of what is right and what is just, and that we're just becoming more and more perfect in our understanding of that, uh, I think neglects the fact that all of those feelings that we have, you know, emerge from biology uh, in ways that you can trace. Uh, you know, it's 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 clear why we have those feelings that we have, and 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 in many cases, those feelings are not are not even um, logically consistent. Uh, this is this is kind of the point of Philippa Foote's trolley problems. Uh, you know, which uh, if you if any of you have watched The Good Place, you've seen like the trolley problems. Uh, you know, kind of played out on on screen. Um, the point of the trolley problems is there are many many ways of formulating these things that reveal that our our, our moral sentiments, our feelings, are not compatible. With some kind of algebra, you know, where where you can where you can just like derive what is right and wrong by just putting things in the right formal language, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, they they are feelings and they're feelings that that have emerged from our our biological um, inheritance. So I, I think that acknowledging that lets us start to be thoughtful about uh, you know what that means, right, in a world that now has all kinds of actors in it that have certain aspects and lack certain aspects of, uh, you know, of what, of what we are um, in ways that are not just reactive, that are not just, not, not just sort of relying on, on, on instincts that no longer necessarily do us service. Um, but, you know, I, I, I mean, Blake, Blake is a smart guy, you know, and, and, and his, um, you know, his, I, I'm sympathetic, right, with his, with his feelings about all of this. And I'm not sympathetic to, um, to his to the the critics of his that have been just sort of like oh well that's just bullshit because it's you know it's a it's a machine uh, and therefore I can't understand can't do any of these things like that 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 kind of reflexivity strikes me as just as naive as the reflexivity that because you know you recognize understanding you recognize other things you know it's a person and it has all the same rights as 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 I do and 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 so on uh, those 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 both strike me as as um, you know relying too heavily on 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 instinct and, and not enough on the kind of weirdness and the complexity uh, of the of the real world. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. I know Audrey's had one for a while. <laughs> okay. um, I was going to ask, like looking at the media, the narrative is always that humans will eventually lose control of AI somehow, but like. Will AI under this like model of unsupervised learning always be dependent on like upon what humans know? For example, like the neuroscientists with brain modeling, or is it possible for them to interact with other AI to somehow surpass that? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question, and. Um, you know, I mean, we were talking about some of the fallacies, uh, you know, or at least what I, what I see is the fallacies of, of people who have been thinking about this kind of stuff. I think one of those fallacies that also comes from our primate ancestry is thinking about everything in terms of individual dominance hierarchies. Um, I find it pretty interesting that all of the people who have talked about, you know, like AIs taking over, um, you know, and us, you know, like moving to the bottom of the hierarchy and so on, are basically all older white men who are at the top of their own hierarchies. 
um, you know, whether that's a Nick Bostrom, an Elon Musk, uh, Stephen Hawking, a Bill Gates, um, the list goes on. Uh, and it's just like, hmm, what, what do all these people have in common? <laughs> like, what is the pattern here? Um, you know, and, and um, you know, it strikes me as a very limited way of thinking. Um, the realities about uh, the way we operate with each other um, are not hierarchical in those ways. Um, you know, it's not like it's not like like human intelligence is something that is you know individualistic, and we are all in these kind of hierarchical relationships with each other. Um, inventions are collective. I mean, somebody asked earlier, like, what was the big, you know, moment or the big transition to unsupervised learning? Like, was there a genius, you know, who figured this out? There was no genius who figured this out. You know, it was it was totally a collective phenomenon. Um, you know, as was the light bulb. Like we have these stories about like the light bulb was invented by so-and-so. No, it was invented by like a dozen people at roughly the same time because all of the ingredients were in the air at that time <laughs> to, to make that happen. And, um, you know, and, and, and so in some sense, I feel like intelligence is, you know, is inherently collective. And what's so interesting about these unsupervised foundation models is that we see intelligence emerging, not from some kind of sealed system, you know, that is operating on its own and that then like emerges as some alien, you know, ready to take us over. But it's something that is very, very kind of, you know, interwoven, right, with human language and, and human culture uh, and, and emerges out of that in the same way that we do uh, and, and, and in interaction with us. So, you know, I, I prefer to think about humanity as uh, a very big tent that, uh, you know, that doesn't only include, uh, you know, other hominids. Uh, you know, that are exactly like us, but that also includes, uh, you know, all of the plants and animals that we, uh, that we rely on, uh, uh, our, our ecosystem, that also includes all of the computers that we make, uh, and the way our culture flows through and is digested by and reflected by all of those technical systems. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, our, the clothes that we're wearing are part of us in a certain way. They've modified our bodies. Uh, you know, and and made made us uh, largely hairless where we weren't before, and you know, and, and uh, you know, the fact that we cook with fire has changed the lengths of our gut. Um, you know, so this idea that 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 we exist in some kind of a state that is separate from nature and from technology strikes me as as uh, as, as naive and hierarchical, uh, and not reflective of of the of the reality, which is that like the whole planet, in some sense, is you know a big intelligent system, uh, and. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's and it's it's really kind of cool that we see intelligence emerging precisely in the moment when we acknowledge that, and uh, and we have we have uh, you know systems that are really just predicting uh, right uh, others, which is us, <laughs> right, other parts of ourself. Um, so uh, yeah, this doesn't mean that there are no dangers, right? It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you know that 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 we don't have like all kinds of hazards uh, ahead of us. Uh, you know, with respect to either planetary resiliency or, um, you know, human beings as we narrowly think about them uh, getting disadvantaged or, or, uh, or, or inequality continuing to rise or other kinds of, uh, you know, of, of problems, right? All of these are real. But the idea that there is some, you know, alien that is now coming and is going to displace us, I think is, is, uh, is, is quite naive and rests on, a, on, a, on, on some wrong assumptions about both what intelligence is and what the whole history of, of, of life and intelligence on Earth has been. And that, that seems like a great question to, uh, to end on. Um, I, I hope this has all been uh, fun for you all and, um, uh, and, and, and useful and interesting. And, um, uh, and have a great rest of your SSP experience. Uh, as, as I said at the beginning, it was very formative for me and I, I hope it is for all of you as well. Um, and your questions um, make me super hopeful about, uh, about where we all are are headed as a species and as a planet. All right, thank you. Thank you all.